And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. Come, the two, the two man, the two man insanity that is that is that is bringing to us a cowboy bebop TTRPG known as Bebop Tabletop. In the in the blue corner, we have we have the we have the man who who claims to be both portentous and pretentious. <laughs> Good. Um, the, the better known as better known as Lijo. Um, hello, hello. And in the and in the blue and in the red corner, the the man the man responsible for responsible for run, for running through way too many Sonic games and a fair amount of existential <laughs> dread. Um, better better known as better known as Fireworks or Woo Fire, depending on how you want to call him. <laughs> how you how you two doing tonight? I don't think I've ever been called fireworks before, but I, I kind of like it. Yeah, I, I will note real quick too that we do have a third man who's not here today, Michael, who's also on our tabletop experiment. Yeah, yeah he is the art guy, and in this case, is so not appearing in this film. <laughs> come on, I'm come on, I'm, le I'm legally obligated to do one Monty Python joke a week. Only one? Okay. <laughs> minimum. Minimum. I try not to. I try not to overdo the. I try not to overdo them. Same reason I don't do many Oli and Lena jokes because nobody's because nobody outside of Minnesota is gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know those <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't say. I think with the Monty Python stuff too, I, I feel like we're aging out. Y you know what I mean? Like it's like, oh, the the kids today don't know the Monty Python anymore. It's like, ooh. <laughs> well then, well then, it's the duty of the old timers to to be the teachers. <laughs> Especially since when, um. I've I've done my fair share of one shots at my LGS, and um, it's always it's always funny when whenever somebody comes in and their only experience is actual plays and Critical Role, especially mm -hmm. <laughs> because they think that they think I'm going to be running things like that. And well, first off, there's a Wayne's World style sign that says absolutely no Matt Mercer, the, <laughs> which the which the uh, owner of the place put in as a joke. But all but also, there are I there are um. There are two sides to every GM. On the one side is let's go on a wonderful adventure. On the other side is I will break you. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's uh it's a it's it's tough because I do want my friends to have fun, but I also want them to struggle occasionally. At least, you know, you know, at least worry that you're going to die. Well, <laughs> in in a lot in in my fair in my fair amount of ca in my fair amount of cases, I usually I usually make explicitly clear what sort of adventure I'm gonna I'm gonna be running and if and it's not it's mm -hmm. not to say you have to do this kind of character but if you but these are the one these are the archetypes that are suggested you can go against that if you want but bear in mind there's going to be consequences. So if we're running an investigation game and you pick murder hobo, well you've got only yourself to blame. Hmm. I think that's like the importance of the session zero concept, right? Like this idea that, hey, before we really dive into, it, and you know, it could be at the beginning of a session too, but before we really get into it, let's let's all get on the same page. We don't have to totally 100% like railroad what we're going to do, but we should at least be on the same page about things that might, you know, upset people. It for me, it's less it's less of what of whether or not I'm going to upset someone, and more of this is this is what I'm running. This is how, this is what this is what I expect. This is what's going to be expected. This is the t this is the tone mm. of the, of this adventure. Be aware. Be sure. aware of this. If you if you are if you if you understand what's com what's coming and you tr and you try and play something that is very much against type, I am not going to hold your hand. Mm -hmm. So if you sure. if you end if you end up if you end up deciding to char to charge the, to charge the guy with a mini who's got a mini gun and all you've got is a pea shooter well <laughs> don't blame me when you end up getting shredded <laughs> is is the, you're, is the you're thing. playing that reality yeah <laughs> yeah i'm i'm reminding them that my job here is to facilitate not handhold mm -hmm. uh, 
But since since we're on that matter, I'd like to get the origin story of sorts when it comes to your guys' introduction into tabletop. Sure. Um, I guess I could start because the my my thinking on it is very strange. I always grew up as a nerd, right? Mm-hmm. But the you know, so I hit my Star Wars and my Star Treks, and you know, I, the Star Wars extended universe was my home for a good ten, fifteen years. But I never crossed into the tabletop realm. So I always knew of Dungeons and Dragons. This is like late mid nineties. And just never found a group. Just never picked up a book and started it myself. So it really wasn't until college, and almost after college already, where we found like-minded individuals, Lee Joe included. I, I actually went to high school with Lee Joe. Mm-hmm. And we discovered, like, oh, this is kind of fun. Like, oh, wait, I get this. I think we our first game was our, our friend Joe uh, just picked up a fourth edition book and said, hey, let's try this. And we said, fine, let's do it. And it was fine. It was okay. It was something that we were all, uh, this is, you know, Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition. Mm-hmm. And, and we all thought, okay, like, this is cool. Let, let's try it. And then about, I think around that time, we did it about once a month, maybe on and off. And then we, like, put it away for a couple of years. And then suddenly, uh, this is a probably late 2018, early 2019. Uh, I, th- I guess this is, you know, Critical Role was getting big at this point. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's probably why the consciousness was up again and we all actually got together and i think almost weekly and probably bi-weekly every two weeks we got together and played some games like we actually ran a campaign for a while Mm -hmm. of course around this time then i also moved halfway across the country and it kind of well for me at least it went away i I think uh lee joe you, you guys probably kept going right for a while yeah not 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 entirely consistently but we tried Right. Yeah. So, so after that, when the pandemic happened and we were all stuck at home, hey, it turns out we've all got time once a week to make to play a game. So around that time, I think Lejo, you, I, and you must have just been the one itching for a game to play, right? It. I mean, yeah. I've, I've been so. Uh, to backtrack, I've I've known about Dungeons and Dragons for a while. I mean, around the honestly the turn of the millennium, uh, you know, I I had been I had friends who were uh, you know really interested, and and I was young, but I was I really wanted to play, and then I moved, and it never happened. I had characters drawn up for D and D three point five, but I never actually ended up properly playing. Uh, so yeah, it took me a while to really get back into it. Um, now, uh, yeah, I think. The biggest issue, and I think the issue many people have, is scheduling as an adult. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, we just couldn't schedule our long sessions anymore. Trying to get anything more than a couple of hours was just becoming impossible. So I kind of posited, all right, let's just do a weekly couple of hours and we'll we'll go from there. And I, so far that's been working. I mean, we're not super, super consistent, but we try almost every week. Mm-hmm. Now... That pre- now since since I often ask this whenever I'm de- whenever I'm dealing with um with pe- with two man teams, but at the risk of of exposing my age, which one to use the Abbot? Which one to use the Costello? Ha! <laughs> uh, I don't know, Lejo. How, how? What do you think? <laughs> I feel like we both kind of occupy the same role a lot of the times in our comedy routine. Which is a little weird. I think it took a while to get us into a groove, actually. Yeah. Oh. I which I can understand that because sometimes sometimes with these kind of things, people will um will swap between both of them interchangeably. Mm-hmm. Um, like I I end up having the, I end up having that with my with my brothers so way too way too many times. <laughs> but that br- that brings me to the, to the other to the other end of the spectrum. So. Going from some, going from something like D and D fourth edition, i.e. the edition everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because, <laughs> um, in the in the words of Goodfellas, "fuck you, pay me." <laughs> um, I, I'm cu- I'm curious, I'm curious how you went, how you ended up leaping from that into doing, your doing a tabletop um spin on Cowboy Bebop. 
Oh, well, to clear up a little bit, we only did 4E for, like, two sessions. After that, we were all in 5th edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Th- yep, go ahead. Please. Well, I've been, you know, we generally keep searching for other tabletops, and I've, you know, we've experimented with some of the GM, GM-less uh, systems, even, like, the kind of semi-one-shots of, like, the Fall of Magic and the Quiet Year. Uh, we've we've dabbled in other things like Moonshot and Powered by the Apocalypse. Uh, basically, we're just trying to find... It, I love D&D, but there, it's not perfect, and there are a lot of things that could be improved. Uh, so we've been trying to find something that uh, that would kind of suit us a little bit better. Um, and in the end, we we I think what really triggered the the idea of Cowboy Bebop is actually I think the Avatar uh, tabletop mm-hmm. role playing game is we saw how how insanely popular uh, the Kickstarter for the game was, and we thought uh, like. It's it's crazy how much later they they created the the tabletop game, and we're wondering like why has no one made like a Cowboy Bebop or a Samurai mm-hmm. Champloo or like a cla- There's so many classic games that could uh, that could work uh, in the tabletop world. Why has nobody made anything to kind of adapt that? And then I think that's I think that's where we just kind of started, and that's where we're at kind of right now, f- working on it. A couple f- a couple funny things to note. Um, one, if if that w- if that was one of the sparks. Um, not sure if you'd not sure if you'd be fans of what I, of what I had to say when I looked through the quick start of the av- mm. of the um, Avatar RPG. That's that's the official one that's being developed. I had um I had some very strong issues with with their design. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, now I'll have to listen to that because we have not yet run. That was going to be a thing we did is just run through that quick start, and it, it just hasn't happened yet. So well, I'm interested to see what you didn't like. I now um, it that was that was a that was a three that was a three parter in the series I do with with um, Good Brother Zan called the Valley of the Judged, where mm. at first we looked at a when at first we looked at a dice breaker article that was going through some of their ideas and we had we had some questions, um, then mm-hmm. the quick start came out and we had more questions, um, as a capstone we sh- we um, showcased Legend of the Elements because. One thing, one thing I want, one thing I especially wanted to make clear is that their choice of using "Powered by the Apocalypse" was not the problem that I had. Mm. The problem, the the big problem that I ha- the big problem that I have is that it feels like a hack of their of one of their previous works, "Masks." Hmm. Um. That at that end, a question that I remember a, a question that I remember asking, and I haven't gotten a satisfactory answer for, is. What is are you trying to are you trying to build this for pe- for your build your are you trying to build this for people who want to who who to out to emulate the kind of stories in the cartoon or to or to use the world or to use the world as a sandbox and this is a question that I remember asking a few years ago when Hyper RPG did that um did that hi- did that Hyperforce actual play. Mm-hmm. Um, this is basically a power, basically a Power Rangers actual, actual, a Power Rangers RPG project a few years before the actual one was announced, which is on the way. Um, but my issue, but in that one, the issue that I had is that it felt like they were trying to emulate the show instead of using the the show's world as a sandbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we ask ourselves this question, I think, almost every time we talk about it, mm-hmm. right? Because that is the core principle of our design, is that we want... Well, you know, we always just have to ask our, que- uh, our question. Mm-hmm. Who is this game for? Right, that, that is number one. And then the, the second question is then, then how do we make that game? Right, how do we make this game for them? I think generally we've decided this game is for... People that are fans of Cowboy Bebop, but that we want to introduce into role playing, mm-hmm. right? Like my, well, you know, it, it, we're lucky if anybody plays your game. That's one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doubly lucky if somebody plays your game more than one time, right? Mm-hmm. But I want people. I expect that people on their first play will be like, okay, I'm going to be Spike Spiegel. I'm going to be Faye Valentine. I'm going to play I, and I'm going to play Jet Black, right? Like I'm. They they know those archetypes. They know those characters because they love this show. And that's who they want to be. That's what they think they want, right? 
and then they'll play that game, and, and hopefully it's fun enough for them to come back. But then when they come back, they can look at the things around the corners. Uh, one of my favorite things about, like, uh, I mentioned the Star Wars Extended Universe already, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that, hey, this universe feels real, feels exciting, feels vital, because things go around the corners, and you believe that they have their own little adventure afterwards, right? So when uh, Boba Fett, right, before, before everything that's happened now in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, Boba Fett shows up for 10 seconds, does a cool nod, says, okay. <laughs> and then he spawns an entire extended universe just because it's like, oh, that's a cool design. And I believe that this guy has a story, mm -hmm. right? The Cowboy Bebop universe, maybe not to that degree, uh, not as deeply as Star Wars, perhaps, but it does have a lot of corners and a lot of edges that are fun to peek around. And I think that this system is being built so that we can actually start exploring those spaces. Right. Yeah. There was there was a game there was a game a few years ago that w as a close equivalent called Bounty Head Bebop that mm. was a bit more crunchy than what it seems you guys are doing. Um, yeah. And but but one. But um, one thing that I, one thing that I find interesting when I look back at say the Firefly RPG that came out a few years ago mm -hmm. is they d they d they didn't they didn't emphasize the, they didn't emphasize the idea of playing at playing as Mal playing as River playing mm -hmm. as Wa playing as Wash etc. But instead you, instead utilize certain archetypes that that um were close. To those to those kind of characters, you know, the ex soldier, the pilot, the mechanic, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But not but not those characters specifically. And I'm not, and I think I I honestly I honestly think that's a far that's a far that's a far better way to, that's a far better way to approach because while some people are certainly going to use it at use it as XPs, um, mm -hmm. by have by having it in that archetype, you're giving them the Wiggle room where they don't have to feel constrained by that, by that um, particular XP. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, the way I see it is that the story of the Bebop crew is possible in this system, mm -hmm. but it is not the only possibility. Yeah. Um, incidentally, the 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 uh, there were two other problems I should I should note, and I I go mm -hmm. into detail on the on this in that thing, although. Although if anybody's sensitive to harsh language, um, I will I will warn them in advance because Zan and I do not hold anything back. <laughs> <laughs> um, they the reasoning that they gave for not having the avatar be playable was suspect. Hmm. The reasoning that they given that they gave in the Dicebreaker article was that was that some things should remain mysterious. <laughs> Whereas mm. I look at it and going, you're take you're taking in you're taking entire storytelling possibilities off the table, because because you because you want to stay cl because you want to stay to canon when you have this whole sandbox and you can't guarantee that it, that a ca that a cast is going to stay is going to stay true to canon or if they even want to, and mm -hmm. you look at you look at most um you look at most campaign settings. They don't have they while they certainly have a canon that's presented, there's the gentleman's agreement of you don't ha you don't have to follow this to the letter. In fact it in fact we encourage you to mess with it as as mm -hmm. much as you need to. Um of course the the I mean what what's to say I mean what's to say what's to say that that um a that you can't do you can't do your own spin on that journey of the of the avatar learning the elements. I know that there's the temptation of an avatar being an alpha class, but it, but it, but it is something to be there. And the funny thing, there's been a whole lot of um, fan um, hackery when it came to when it came to Avatar. Mm -hmm. Third, fourth, and fifth edition have had their takes, and a bunch of other games have attempted, including Genesis in the form of the Second Age, which is something I brought up in, in that thing because, well. There's a lot of comp even though there's a, not a lot of official competition. There's a lot of competition. Period. Sure. <laughs> but it, it's such a popular franchise that yeah. everybody wants. Yeah, everybody wants to play. Well, well, everybody wants an Earthbend, right? Like it's just like, it, oh yeah. <laughs> it's a mix of a popular, a mix of a popular franchise, 
a a setting a setting that has a whole lot of potential story that you can tell um mm-hmm. in the same in the same vein as what Casey Hudson said about the um Citadel in Mass Effect that he want that he wanted a place where you could tell any kind of story mm-hmm. um and and the and this and this and I'd say for a lot of people it was their first introduction into um Wuxia or mm-hmm. Tian, oh, that's true although too, it's yeah. um, it's debatable whether Avatar is a Wuxia or Tiansha story and there's a very distinct difference between the two um but when but shifting this over to to something to something like um Bebop there even though there's a whole there's a whole lot of lived in when it comes when it comes to the setting and the possibility of those of those kind of stories especially since there's there's certain there's certain stories in the in the past and present in that setting that are hinted at but never un, but never told i'd say one big example is the titan war i mean mm. you can infer that it's that it's the equivalent of vietnam be, based on how it's described but it's ne- but it's never go- it's never um, gone into exactly what exactly what went down. Right. It's kind of a uh, you know it's a, it's a trope shortcut, right? Like you're just taking the things you've seen before and adapting them. Yeah, you know, minus the specifics. Mm-hmm. And I'm not... But one thing that I did notice in that arc setup that you get that you guys have is is um. A kind, a kind of, a kind of setup around around bounty hunting, which is understandable. That's a, sure, that's an easy, yeah. that's an easy work, that's an easy work with. But I'm cur- based on how it was, based on how it's structured, I'm reminded of Blades in the Dark. I'm curious if that mm. was an influence on you guys. Uh, funnily enough, uh, <laughs> not originally. I mean, we we mm-hmm. did. We did uh, look into it as we started our kind of project, and there are definitely some things that we that we started to think about and that ended up being <laughs> components of Blades of the Dark. Like, we have a concept of a motivation tracker that we didn't realize is very similar to the clock system Blades in the Dark uses. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when I found out about that, I'm like, this is very similar, and uh, it has very similar concepts. Uh, so, like, we, you know, we are kind of, you know, we don't want to inadvertently steal from anything, so we're we're trying to skim, uh, skim as many of uh, the, you know, dozens upon dozens of RPGs, but uh, nothing, uh, you know, I guess, yes, yeah, so... It, uh, I have that comes to mind now as I'm as we're still creating it, but like originally, no, this a lot of this ended up being just kind of off the cuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one one of the reasons. So in the original version that we wanted to build out of this uh, was not a podcast. Originally, uh, you mentioned the Firefly uh, based on the Cortex system. Yeah. Uh, version and that was originally when I was uh, I don't know this is earlier this year and we just wanted this game. Uh, I just started reading a bunch of other books and seeing, well, you know, a lot of people have mentioned, oh, the Firefly RPG, that's probably adaptable. You can hack that into a a Cowboy Bebop world. And so, you know, started taking a look at that a little bit and realized, like, ah, this isn't quite what I want. Uh, uh, Somebody mentioned, yeah, the Blades in the Dark uh, Scum and Villainy mod, I think, is, is the space western version. And, you know, started looking at that a little bit. It's like, ah, this isn't quite what we want either. So the genesis of the podcast was that, well, let's have a discussion, three of us, right? Uh, let's have a discussion about how we should design this game. And we can also tie it in to like a rewatch. Like I was already starting to do that where I was watching one episode of Cowboy Bebop at a time just to like pull stuff out. Like, oh, let me write down uh, my original notes were things like, uh, who are the new characters? What What happened this episode? What is the... What is the loose structure of what happened this week? And then what kind of tech shows up or what kind of ships happen or what is what are the rules for jumping into hyperspace, right? Like th- things like of that nature. I was just writing this down for details for building my own mod. In that process, I realized like, oh, we should have a discussion about this one week at a time mm-hmm. and build a system and hey, you know that discussion. Other people might be interested yeah. in that. Uh, other people might be interested in how we're coming up with our decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, hold that. Th- hold that thought. I got. To, I've got to take care of one small thing. 
And we are back. Sorry about the in sorry about the interruption. <laughs> so, I guess to I guess to follow up on on that kind of thing, the um, since you mentioned you mentioned um you mentioned court you mentioned cortex or rather cortex mm -hmm. plus. Although yes. I suppose nowadays it's cortex. It's prime now. Yeah. <laughs> it's prime. Still waiting on what? Still waiting on when Tales of Zadia is gonna come out so I can cover something using Cortex Prime. Hmm. Since hmm. the last Cortex book I cover I covered was years ago, and that was Marvel Heroic, and I'm still salty about how that got treated. <laughs> that was kind of the end of Cortex too, right? Like they just stopped supporting after that point. No, Firefly came after that. Oh, Firefly came after. Okay, yeah. I think. Um, Cortex Prime ha happened when the when the Cortex system was was um, acquired by Fandom. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the part I'm familiar with now. Um, but these, but given given that the other re the other reason I ended up getting a blaze getting blaze in the dark flashback was the notes hmm. on on skill on um, skill checks, where you have. Sure. A, yeah. You have difficulty um, set at a set at a di at a die at a die number mm -hmm. at a die type, and if they roll an eight, it's an absolute success. If they roll a seven, it's a success, but with consequences. That very much reminds me of the success and success, but or failure a or failure and approach that it is seen in. Um, Powered by the apocalypse and subsequently blades in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm actually taking that from a. So I've never played Blades and I've never played Powered by the Apocalypse mm -hmm. uh, games, but I, I, I've seen that in a lot. I, I want to say I saw that in a very a very small uh, one shot by a guy named Paul Dean called Moonshot, and he had a very similar like graded success system. Like it's um I think. Uh, Caltrop Core is, I think, another one that's doing this, where, uh, it, you know, you only roll the Caltrops, the D4s, and your 4 is an absolute success, your 1 is an absolute failure, and then 2 and 3 are somewhere in between, right? And I think that just as a roleplay mechanic, right, it, absolute success is fine, but weird success is cooler, right? Like, you, could get, you get to flavor... Like oh we we succeeded but also something bad happened or or we failed but we got a little bit of a boon from it somehow right I, I, that stuff fascinates me mm -hmm. yeah I, I like to refer to it as the but and rule hmm yeah um but when I when I looked at one one um one question that I do have is are you guys going for a purely skill based skill based system like they like um. The kind of, like um a like amp year one or are you go or are you going f are you going for the traditional attribute skill relationship? Uh, we had a discussion about this, uh, Lijo. I think just this week, right? Yeah, and I, I think our uh, I think that's what next week or the week after the uh, episode weeks, is about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is we are we're trying we're considering leaning away from. Uh, attribute skills mostly because uh like they're they're such a they're a lot of skills tend to kind of uh, merge there's not i don't sometimes i don't like the fact that like literally one number is all it takes for you to say yes or no i'm good or bad at this i think that a lot of skills have um, a fluidity to them. You may not be good in this type of situation, but you can you but you can use this and that. Um, we're we're probably closer to paranoia, if anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael uh, where, brought that up this week. Yeah, yeah. Where no, we're not cleared for that, citizen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, where you know they have kind of you know a couple of headers of you know quote unquote skill types, and then you have a checklist of li of skills. I think that's where we're leaning towards more, just so that. Uh, it kind of gives you a quick snapshot of what you are or are not good at. And uh, basically, you know, we don't want you to just, I don't, we don't, we don't want the, you know, D&D &D version of, well, I have a negative two to athletics, but I'm still going to roll this and see what happens. You know, we want you to at least try to be good at something you're doing. And actually, 
it, it, it also this is I, I just thought of this right now where it eliminates one of my least favorite things in D anD D, which is when you meta about your your modifiers. It's like, oh, somebody needs to investigate this. Like, well, I've got a plus one investigation. He's got like a plus three in investigation. It's like, well, I don't like I don't enjoy that table talk, right? <laughs> like, because it's not really. I, I guess I, maybe it's just the way we've been playing it in like our groups where I, I feel like, yeah, you could turn that into an RP moment and should, mm-hmm. but just cause you know, there's a plus one and they, Oh, they've got a plus three. It's like, yeah, he's going to do it. Cause it's plus three. And that feels bad to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, I do want to clarify that when I mentioned the attribute skill dichotomy, I wasn't going with the whole, the whole set relation with each, but more anytime you're rolling, you're rolling a combination of the two. Um, you know, some like like in say World of Darkness, mm-hmm. where the where the attributes and skills aren't necessarily it, it isn't a what it isn't a one tie one tied to the to, to the other binary the way it is for say the D twenty system. Sure. Is mm-hmm. so they they roll separately is what you're saying. Like you um, can roll. No, you're ro- you're rolling this in. The storyteller system in World of Darkness, you're rolling the sum of an attribute and skill, but it's not a case where every skill is, asso- is always associated with one attribute. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I want I wanted to I wanted to make that cl- wanted to make that clear. Yeah, uh, one one of the one of the goals of our game also is to do as little math as possible, right? Um, things like attributes, things like modifiers are almost like so you know the reason we 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 kind of go back and forth on it still is because it's almost too much math but it's not quite too much math like like I'd be okay with mod I, I think I'd be okay with modifying a dice roll like I think I'd be okay with that but if we can avoid it entirely I think that's even better I think that is a better system for what we're trying to build uh, one of the goals yeah, again, the overarching goal is to emulate this TV show. And one of the things in this TV show is fluidity and speed. Mm-hmm. Tempo, right? So doing math, that is the opposite of that. I mean, unless you're all calculators, which is, yeah, you know, awesome table, but <laughs> but not not me. I I will make I will make sh- I will make sure that if I'm at the table, I will break out the TI-83 so I know exactly what my <laughs> probability is. The silver? I've got the silver, man. You can't beat that. <laughs> No, I got it in black. Because <laughs> I take the Model T approach with my equipment. Any color as long as it's black. <laughs> as long as it's black, yeah. <laughs> but the re- given given that kind of um, given that kind of fluidity, mm-hmm. I'm I'm cur- when it came to doing that when it came to doing that kind of research. I'm I'm curious if I'm curious if implementing some sort of stunt system is something that you guys have um, talked about. How do you mean? Well, a few ex- a few examples of this kind of thing is um is the is the stunt bonus that's that's given for descriptive action in ga- in games like Exalted. Um, Feng Shui also ha- also has a similar thing when it comes to how. Y- how you how you describe how you describe your action because both both of them are trying to go for the, for a degree of a degree of over the topness, mm-hmm. and obviously one one of the inspirations for something like Cowboy Bebop is John Woo movies. So you've got that. So you've got that element there. Mm. So I was I was curious yeah. if the idea of of re- of rewarding rewarding descri- rewarding descriptiveness is is something mm. that had been considered. So actually, I, I realize in the document we sent over, uh, we don't have anything about gambits, and that is something we've talked right. about a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, we we've described a gambit as uh, basically there's one big gambit per episode, right? The the highlight move of a character making a play that saves the day, right? That is your game. The Sakuga moment. Absolutely, yeah. The, if you, if you, uh, I think when we discuss gambits most in depth, we were talking about there's a moment where Spike decides, oh, the only way out of the situation is for me to jump out into space without a suit on. Right? It's like, oh, that's a gambit. Right? That is a move. That is, you are doing something that 
is make or break is the big gamble is the you know all all the marbles right are on the table uh, what a weird mixed metaphor that is but you know all the marbles are on the table and we're playing for the whole house of cards here right checkmate uh, one thing we're trying to sorry uh one thing we're trying to avoid is the what's the word we do not want to encourage overly safe play like mm-hmm. again in some in in some game systems if you take the optimal action uh you'll do the best you'll do the best in that round but like it's also kind of boring um gambits we're trying to promote a way to for a high risk high reward action because i mean we want this we want the scenario this encounter to accelerate to that kind of you know, fever pitch climax that, uh, that, you know, again, action movies versus Cowboy Bebop versus, you know, and just like pretty much any good story has that climax. And we want that to be kind of an accelerating uh, moment. And we're, again, we are still in the, uh, you know, in the woods as we're, as we're still building this, but we're trying to figure a way to incorporate all this. Mm -hmm. Now, with now with that with that kind of thing in mind when it comes to when it com- when it comes when it comes to in enc- when it comes to encounters um would it be fa- would it be fair to say that you're that you kind of build encounters and even individual sessions almost as if a session is the equivalent of well a session in the show <laughs> mm, yeah. exactly yeah like that is the goal right is we're all uh, you know, so one of the uh, goals of this game is also to build a game that I personally can run and play, right? And, you know, me... ...of as much... Uh, I don't have the the Twilight Imperium eight-hour day game. Yeah, that maybe only happens like once a year at this point, if that. Uh, so if I can get a weekly three-hour RPG session in, that's awesome. And if that weekly RPG system or RPG game day is three hours long and plays a full episode of Cowboy Bebop, awesome! Like that is that's exactly what I'm aiming for. Mm-hmm. Now, no, no, sorry, go ahead. The the other thing the other thing I was curious about because this is something that some that some games some games struggle with because any. It, it's easy to do an encounter when you're on terra firma, when you're on Mar, mm-hmm. when you're on Mars, when you're on, when you're in Tijuana, what have you. Um, it's far more tricky to do th- to do that in space, and given how every uh, all, all of the more active members of the Bebop crew mm-hmm. have their own have their own personal ship that's ho- that's housed in inside, housed inside the Bebop. Um. And this is especially the case with the swordfish too. How how do you get how do you guys plan on handling dog fighting? So we talked about it a little bit, I think, in our third podcast episode, our third podcast session. We also call them sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, so this was very early in our design, so we hadn't nailed some things down yet. But at the time, we discussed the idea of there being almost like a flight module, almost like a more complex flight versus a simple, simple flight encounter, right? Because, uh, and, and at the time, we were still deciding, you know, how crunchy should this game be, right? Like, currently, we don't have a, a table, like or like a map, right? We don't have a... In our minds right now, this is all theater of the mind, right? Mm. Everybody's playing together by imagining what's happening without moving things around at a table. Uh, flight might be an exception to that, right? Are we, you know, we haven't fleshed this out in any way, really. Mm. But this idea that there's a more complex flight model, which is uh, like, hey, yeah, if you're flying the Swordfish 2, it has all these stats. If you're flying uh, Phase Red Tail, you have all these stats, Right, that that could be something we go deeper into. Mm-hmm. I think for the case of this base game, though, that is not the focus. Right, like every every session of Cowboy Bebop 
yeah, usually has some sort of space fight or some sort of chase sequence, right, in vehicles. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't really matter what their ship is, you know, generally. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes Jet uses his uh, tow cable, right, and sometimes uh, Spike uses his plasma cannon. But otherwise, there's not a whole lot of, to me at least, there's not a whole lot of interesting role play there necessarily. Although in that the, be sorry, yep. I was gonna I was gonna say, well, if you want if you want role if you want role if you want role playing in the skies, we can always steal some notes from Ace Combat. Of course, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Lejo, what were you gonna say? Uh, basically, the other thing is we're still uh, we're still kind of brainstorming what we want to do with ships in general. Um, like one of the things we're considering for rewards, because in lieu of leveling. Uh, is is upgrades to your ship, and the, that should inherently give you some sort of buff, or in case of you know damage to the ship, some sort of you know uh, what the opposite of a buff debuff. Uh, <laughs> you know the so if you upgrade your crew quarters, maybe your readiness for this is better, or if you improve your weapons, uh, you roll better, or you know we're still toying with how we want to do this. We still want. Uh, we still want our combat and everything to be fast and chaotic, but also like there is there needs to be a little bit of crunch. Uh, I've been kind of you know I've been listening to the Adventure Zones uh, Ether Sea campaign, and they have actually something very similar to what I was thinking with their uh, ships, uh, their ship combat, where they have kind of a readiness uh, sort of stat, which is based on how you know how stocked up on rations you are, how how the state of your crew quarters, how, you know, the your piloting skill, these sort of things. And I'm I'm wondering if we should add them to the, the game. But we may also just kind of make it a sort of, you know, ancillary. If this is something that interests you, you can add this, or otherwise we might just keep it simple. So, uh, again, we are, we, we've only had a few, you know, less than a dozen episodes, so we're mm-hmm. we're working on it, you know? Yeah. And I'm, ge- I'm guessing that when it comes to character creation, you guys are going a bit freeform. In terms of not not having a whole having, at best having archetypes, but nothing like the playbooks that, I, that in Blades in the Dark or anything like that. Yeah, well, you know, at at the least, yeah, we're not doing a rigid class system, right? I think that's something we're actively avoiding. Mm-hmm. But the uh, yeah, like because the I think one of the things we determined was that while watching the show, is that all of the characters, yes, they have specializations. But they're all generally capable, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody is uh, n- nothing in the show, and so that, like that might be one of the reasons why this hasn't been fully adapted. I mean, there's an official adaptation coming out next year, which you know we'll see how that goes as well. But I, well, I think one of the reasons why this hasn't been fully adapted is that you know most most RPGs, I don't know about most, but a lot of RPGs have a class system, and Cowboy Bebop doesn't right the show does not have classes funny thing about that classes in rpgs once you once you step out once you step outside the d20 bubble they're actually in the minority yeah i i think it's a reaction to the the rigidness of classes right um that's that's a very that's a very trick that's a very tricky thing to unpack because because a lot of a lot of the games that ended up going a bit more freeform. Yes, there were some that were reacting to that, but there were but there were some that did that sim- simply because the subject matter, um, you mm. couldn't you couldn't really do you couldn't really do a cl- a class system like for like for instance um supers whether it be villains sure. or vigilantes or champions and in the case of something like traveler well tra- well um. Trying to trying to trying to put a class system in what in what it was doing was going to be impossible from the get go, and there's a bu- and there's a bunch of others. Basically, the um that ki- that kind of that kind of class system is lar- is largely an artifact of miniature war games. And mm-hmm. if you're yeah. and, um, when you're not do when you're not doing something that's an artifact of that, there's no reason to keep it, unless you unless you absolutely wish to. In in my in my opinion, at least, um, I do see. But I, in my personal opinion, I find archetypes to be a nice little middle ground. Um, mm-hmm. like a couple of exa- a couple of examples of games that do archetypes. World of Darkness does this a lot, where 
just because just because you are just because you I'll use Exalted as an example. Just because you are a Solar Exalted, possibly of the Dawn cast, there's going to be some skills that you'll have an easier time learning, but you're not limited to that. Um, in something mm, like Anima yeah. or Rollmaster, you have you have that sa you have that same kind of vibe of this is an umbrella this is an umbrella that you're slightly be that you're going to be slightly better at um, you at using, but that's not the be all and end all. Right, oh. it gives you better flexibility to. Yeah, it, like I, I, I know Dungeons and Dragons is trying their trying to multi-class again, right? Or like they've always. They're they've been trying yeah. they've been trying they've been trying multi-classing for twenty, trying right. one form or another yeah. for over twenty years, and they can't. And the prop the problem is they have way too many people to answer to, and they, mm -hmm. and if I'm being honest, they already they already solved the multi-classing problem in fourth edition, but they don't want to acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> because that because back in fourth edition multi-classing was handled as a subtype of feats mm, yeah because people yeah. only multi-class because they want they want to dip into something in order to get it right um yeah. but that but given the fact that you're going a bit more free form that has that has its own consequences one of the big one one of the big ones that happens with a large majority of um universal style games you know your gurps your hero mm -hmm. um savage worlds to a much lesser extent is choice paralysis yep. because a lot a yep. lot of times especially especially in the early 2000s the mindset was here's a bunch of points here's the here's the stuff you can spend it on now swim damn it <laughs> and is that something that you guys have been conscious of to make sure that with care that even though you guys aren't using um, classes or archetypes, you don't want to overwhelm um, choice possibility. So we we haven't talked about this in a couple of weeks now, but we did discuss character creation as a choose your own adventure kind of system. Oh, like the uh, li like the life path system. Yes, yeah, like, just like in Math Mass Effect, right? It has that as well. Um, where Mass Effect we has it. But when it comes, but when it comes to the realm of tabletop, a bet a good example would be um, would be the interlock system that's used in Cyberpunk. Oh sure, 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 sure. Yeah, like the idea that yes, there may be again our target audience is likely to be people that, or I should say, is we our ideal target audience would be one that is not super familiar with tabletop gaming, right? That maybe has played a game or two of Dungeons and Dragons, kind of liked it, but really likes Cowboy Bebop, right? That is, uh, in my head, that's the person that I'm looking at to try this game. Mm -hmm. And for them, yes, that, that analysis paralysis, that choice paralysis is going to be super present if our system is too, uh, the opposite of heavy-handed, if it's too loose, mm -hmm. right? So part of the... And then, you know, and then on the opposite end, you want to make sure that you don't want to build something that's so restrictive, right? That is so locked down that you can only play, you know, grizzled ex-cops, right? Or you can only play, you know, like we don't want to end up in a, a place where it's so strict that you can't actually extend beyond the bounds. We don't want to be just an emulation of the show. In mm -hmm. So the... I think the solution, and we haven't worked on this too much, so it's still very early. The solution is that, well, if we design the system to be open, mm -hmm. but then build a bunch of guides to help people navigate through that openness, uh, you know, it's kind of, um, think of it like a tutorial in a video game, right? They kind of suck, but there are ways to make them good where you experiment by playing, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you... If you teach someone, I think of uh, Portal, the video game, a lot. Because that whole game is 50% tutorial. Yeah. Like, the whole first half of that game is just teaching you the rules. Mm -hmm. And then, in the end, you know enough, you feel enough that you can say, Hey, yeah, they taught me these rules, but I can do this, too, right? That seems like it should work, and it should work, right? So, in, in our case for character creation... The idea is that, like, okay, you know, if you don't, if you're new, like, if you're just reading this for the first time, you pick this book up, you know, or somebody said, hey, check this out, and you've never run a game before, you've never built a character before, 
I, we want you to be able to say, okay, hey, a- answer these questions, simple questions, right? Like, do you want, did, where did you grow up? Like, oh, uh, Mars or an asteroid or on a truck in space? Like, okay, so check that box or flip to this page, go to look at this section, mm-hmm. or even could be like, oh, and add these stats to your character sheet, right, just because of that, right? And then in the end, you answer a whole bunch of questions, and you have a, you know, basically the archetype of a character at that point. It's like, oh, you've, based on these things you've selected, you are this person, and you have these stats, and then you can play. Right? That doesn't mean that's the only kind of character you can play. And it doesn't mean that only the questions you answer on this survey are the only way you can play. No, you can do anything with any of the stats however you'd like. Right? And we'd probably provide some guidance for that as well. But, like, that is the, you know, we're, we're trying to hold your hand <laughs> to play this game. We want you to enjoy this game, even if you have no idea what you're doing, right? We want you to figure, to learn that there's more to play with here. Mm-hmm. Now, taking, now taking that, in, taking that into, into account, um, when it comes to, when it comes to, adva- when it comes to advancement, um, since you brought up Cortex, that has a very interesting approach to how it utilizes XP, how it utilizes the means in which you gain XP. Mm-hmm. Is some, something like that, not necessarily not necessarily one-to-one, obviously, but something in that trigger-based approach been something you guys have considered? I, I think so. And I think it was, it was not super deliberately copying or, or it wasn't super deliberately like that close to Cortex, but I think it just happened that way because we ended up trying to build a more narrative game, right? Where uh, I love the idea that your character is the summation of the things that have happened to them, right? So advancement is learning something because of something that happened. And ideally, that thing that happened happened at the table, Right. Uh, your initial character, of course, is not because you're creating this sheet. But then, hey, if you uh, one, I, I think I brought up this example before on our show where uh, one of our friends, Brandon, uh, had his paladin get attacked by some some corrosive slimes. Right. Uh, Legia, you were the DM on that, right? Uh, I, this was very early. I think they were ochre jellies. Yeah, they they were. It consumed his sword and yada yada. But like it, it it gave this pal it gave this paladin character a crippling fear of slimes, and that was fun. It was uh, I mean, it's a fun role play moment. Uh, but regardless, I think that one of the things that you know we're trying to steer away from is kind of you know our some RPG systems, including Dungeons and Dragons, uh, have kind of a zero to hero kind of trajectory, and I don't think that necessarily. Uh, it coincides with Cowboy Bebop. You, you do. They do get better at what they do. They do improve, but they're never going to save the galaxy in the same way D and D heroes might. Yeah, and I remember. I remember back in the day when I when I was doing a lot of stuff with with um Marvel Heroic, mm-hmm. which is which is where which is where I got reintroduced to Cortex, a system mm-hmm. that I initially wrote off in the mm-hmm. in the original Cortex days, but a concept that they had br- that they had brought up oh, that they had br- that was brought up by by people who were homebrewing like like um like exploring exfin- exploring infinity is the idea of horizontal advancement instead of vertical advancement hmm um uh, this I- this idea that there that there are certain things that would be at and this is something you see in comic books a lot things that would be added but not necessarily unnecessarily leveling up in the traditional sense um, to use an example, things like say Spider-Man getting the black suit. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't up his ability. It, it, it get. It's. It's giving some more options, and those options are eventually going to be taken away at the end of, the, at the end of the events, as we all know. <laughs> but it's not. But it's not. A, it's not a case of leveling up. Right, I, and I think that is that makes perfect sense in a superhero based mm-hmm. story because yeah you know yeah sometimes they go more powerful but generally they're as mighty as they're uh, they're yeah. they will ever be right yeah. they they won't oh, unless you do the dragon ball z right where where you end that's up with a, whole, a massive a power creep right ca- that's a, well that's a whole other can of wor- can of worms entirely but <laughs> with the 
within within the within the um setup the one thing one thing that one other example that I that I could bring up is um Numenera and subsequently the cipher system where you have you have you have a mix of horizontal and vertical but it's not necessarily mm. going going on an upward scale but more of expanding what you can do with the with the core setup right and that that makes sense too as just a player you know outside of the system as a as a meta as you are generally learning the system as you play it that makes perfect sense right give me cuz this works really well in dungeons and dragons leveling as well where yeah the first two three levels I, there's nothing class specific really right it's just it's just a bunch of mechanical things you learning to fight learning to move but then you pick a subclass and then you learn a whole bunch of new spells or then you get a whole bunch of new abilities and that works great because you are you now have you're building a base of what you know as you progress right yeah now th that brings that um that brings me to how, how to in how to integrate how to integrate the past i've seen mm. some games introduce concepts of of um flashback mechanics um, Nibiru is is one major example of this kind of thing. That's all. That's all about flashbacks in mm -hmm. one form or another. And some and some others have some others have taken that kind of approach. Because aside from Ed and I, Ein, although that although that's debatable on the on Ed's case, each of each of the each of the primary characters on the Bebop have some sort of past they can't they can't move on from for one reason or another, whether it's whether it's Spike relationship with Ju with Julia and his and his time and his time in the red in the Red Dragon Triad, um, Faye's whole Faye's whole thing with her past and and the mountain of debt that keeps chasing her, <laughs> um, or J or Jet being the ar the archetype of the the archetype of the film of the film noir detective, <laughs> um, and I'm curious if that if if you guys have been discussing how to integrate something some sort of some sort of system like that where there's some sort of defining past for player characters Legion, you want to talk about the pillar system so you're you're absolutely right and i think that when we boiled it down to uh, when we when we when, it, when we came down to brass tacks with this it's just every character in the every main character in Cowboy Bebop kind of has the same three pillars uh, when you have to define them. They were there is a a past, there is something the world did to screw them over, and then there is something there there is what they did to to get past that how or how they carry that weight or what they how do they move on from here. Um, and I think that that's what we want people to focus on when they're creating their character more is just, uh, if you live in this world, why, like, and especially because we're focusing on bounty hunting, why are you bounty hunting? It's not, it's not fun. It's not glamorous. Uh, the jobs you do really suck. Like, um, so why are you doing this? And usually in the case of... Uh, Cowboy Bebop, it's because you were betrayed or uh, something you you wanted all this time is not exactly what uh, what you what you know is all kind of you know it's meant to be you know. Um, so while flashbacks, I think, are a you know a great storytelling device, and you know you I don't use them particularly you know often. Um, I think that inherently you're. You the way your play style and your actions in the game should reflect who you are and what's happened to you. And I think that you know your story should you know not only be incorporated into the main game where you know maybe you meet up with the guy who betrayed you or the person who released you from your cryo sleep or whatever, uh, but also like you know this is these are character moments, these are RP moments. Like I we want we want people to have that freedom. And yes. Uh, some people are going to run with it, and some people won't. But I think that's uh, part of the you know the name of the game here. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with all of the, with all of that in mind, I know you guys have been mostly have been mostly doing um, 
mostly doing the pod mostly doing the podcast episodes. Do you plan do you plan on putting out an alpha sometime in 2022? Oh, yes. Uh we are well, you know, so we're going on a little bit of a holiday break. I don't know when this when this episode's going to go out, but uh, we're going on a little bit of a holiday break and while we're doing that, we're going to be planning out our next year's episodes. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I'm so you know you know in addition to this being a tabletop project, this is also our first podcast project. And a, a like I've been looking for uh, you know th- this place included uh, podcast tabletop podcasts that are focused on design, right? More so than focused on actual play. Mm-hmm. And one of the things now I'm looking at in terms of formatting is how do we how do we incorporate play testing into a podcast format without, you know, I think Lejo's fear is that we turn into just an actual play from that point on, because uh, we don't really want that. <laughs> uh, I, that's something we're going to be working out. Mm-hmm. Right? Just so, and then once we've got some drafts up, once we have some, some more eyes working on it, when, once we have, I think my, my favorite milestone is like, once someone that is not us runs a game, Right. That's when I start to feel like, okay, let's publish. Let's put some some alphas out. Let's get more and more eyes on it if we can. Mm-hmm. And that should be yeah, early early next year, hopefully. All things all things going well. And we'll probably also have to discuss, you know, the other components of uh, RPG creation, you know, uh, we briefly touched about like needing to acquire art assets and, you know, publishing and, you know, like, fi- figuring out how not to get a cease and desist, you know, like it's, mm-hmm. it's all, it, it, you know, obviously creating a tabletop RPG is work and uh, we're going to have to figure out how to navigate that too as, you know, complete rank amateurs, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I personally look forward to seeing how it how it develops and 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 I, and like i said i don't i know that i know that the official one is is going to be is going to be coming but i don't want that to be the be all end all of this idea mhm yeah that that's exactly we so we had this idea earlier this year we we picked up the at @bebop tabletop twitter handle right sometime in september and then between then and our, uh, and then we recorded an episode. Mm-hmm. And then between when we recorded the episode and when we released the episode, uh, the official Bebop uh, game was announced. And we're like, well, are we done? Do we just stop? Do we just not publish? But yeah, for, for exactly that same reason, we thought, well, no, we're probably going to have a unique take on it. And given, given, the, given the handful of RPGs that I've, even the handful of fan RPGs I've seen that are, that adapt po- that adapt um, Pokemon or Digimon, or mm-hmm. uh, or uh, or things like the Naruto Five E project. Um, mm-hmm. More, um, this wouldn't. This isn't gonna be. This isn't gonna be the first. This isn't gonna be the first ende- endeavor on these kind of things. Um, right. Yep. And even we, and even 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 if that's not the case, well. Back back in two thousand four, D six space was basically Star Wars D six without without the Star Wars in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, there are a lo- uh, you mentioned which one? Bounty Bounty Head Blues, I think. Bounty also, Head there Bebop. there are Bounty Head Bebop. Yeah, there are a few other systems out there too that are directly inspired by Cowboy Bebop. Mm-hmm. Um, Orbital Space Blues is one, and uh, well, you know, there there are a lot, and they all look interesting. We haven't gone into any depth on any of them yet mm-hmm. but at some point we would also want to look at and compare them just to see like well what elements of the show did they take you know what what parts of uh, one of the, one of the i think the more interesting things about our podcast is that it is a story of adaptation right how do you adapt another work into another format and i'd love to compare and see and you know since, since i don't i don't think any of the other creators of those games have published their notes in that way. I'd love to see, like, well, how did they reach this decision? Uh, and in our case, you can hear it weekly, right? <laughs> yeah. And I will, I will look forward to seeing how it how it develops. But, and I, w- and I wish you the best of luck in tw- in twenty twenty two, and may, and may the art, may the um, may the di- may the dice gods be a little bit merciful. 
<laughs> we sure hope so. because they, because they are not mercy because they have no mercy. <laughs> As any as anyone who has has had to deal with XCOM flashbacks will tell you, yeah. <laughs> that ninety eight percent chance doesn't mean what I think it does. No, it mean, it, mean, it means exactly one thing: bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mildred, thank you very much for having us on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. Any, anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>